It's an interesting problem uh, combined with um, just having a learner's mindset and innate curiosity and, uh, and not, not being afraid, peering inside the black box of something. For, this is just knowledge. It's like, you know, like, you know, cracking open a book off the library shelf. I mean, it's a very different kind of knowledge. It's knowledge that uh, changes on an ongoing basis because, you know, the Linux kernel is a, it's, it's a moving, it's a living organism. It's a moving system. You know, it's constantly changing, uh, you know, on a regular basis. So uh, open mind, uh, curiosity, and, you know, uh, check your ego at the door because you're, you're not going to understand the whole thing and you don't have to, to do something impactful. Welcome to the Software Misadventures podcast, where we sit down with software and DevOps experts to hear their stories from the trenches about how software breaks in production. We are your hosts, Ronak, Austin, and Guang. We've seen firsthand how stressful it is when something breaks in production, but it's the best opportunity to learn about a system more deeply. When most of us started in this field, we didn't really know what to expect and wish there were more resources on how veteran engineers overcame the daunting task of debugging complex systems. In these conversations, we discuss the principles and practical tips to build resilient software, as well as advice to grow as technical leaders. Hey everyone, this is Ronak here. In this episode, Guang and I speak with a colleague of mine, Ryan Underwood. Ryan is a staff SRE and tech lead on the Helix and Zookeeper SRE team at LinkedIn. He's an amazing engineer, someone I've personally learned a lot from, especially about debugging distributed systems. I don't know of anyone else who understands the Linux stack better than him. His opinion about not creating software as a black box and his persistent approach to debugging complex problems are truly inspiring. As the team at LinkedIn was upgrading hosts to forward X kernel, they observed elevated 99th percentile latencies in some critical applications. We speak with Ryan about what exactly this problem was and how it was fixed. We also discuss some of the tools and practices that are helpful in debugging system performance issues. Please enjoy this deeply technical and highly educational conversation with Ryan Underwood. Cool. Ryan, uh, welcome to the show. Um, to get us started, tell us about your background. I'm especially curious about what kind of got you in, uh, you know, excited about computers and how you entered the infrastructure engineering space. Wow. Uh, that's a long story, but I would say uh, what first got me interested in computers was uh, finding a, uh, a computer that I did not know was a computer that my, my dad had brought home uh, when I was something like four or five years old. And I actually thought it was a VCR because I was familiar with VCRs at the time. I'm like, oh, here's this, this box that appears similar to uh, size and shape and uh, similar... Um, materials composition as this thing that uh, ingests uh, video cassettes and you know puts uh, colorful sounds and uh, pictures on the screen for me. So uh, anyway, over a period of weeks or months, my, my dad set it up and started uh, showing me how to use it. We had some, uh, some, some books and magazines that I could type basic programs into it, uh, you know, using DOS and, uh, you know, just all, all the things we did back in the day. Of course, I was in it for the games. It was all about the games. And, you know, uh, the the machinery itself was just, uh, you know, a, a means to the end of playing cool games. Uh, <laughs> I had a neighbor kid who lived across the street who's now a special effects director in, in Hollywood uh, whose dad worked for IBM. And so his dad was always bringing home the goods. And, you know, the neighbor kid always had the... Uh, you know, the latest and greatest uh, uh, IBM PC Junior. And then, you know, he had a 286 and then a 486 leapfrogging, uh, whatever I had at the time. So I was always jealous, but he also had all the cool games that, uh, you know, we just swapped discs back and forth. And um, yeah, so, you know, from there to, you know, writing, you know, I mean, I was doing like DOS batch programming, uh, you know, on on floppy disks, just like automating the startup of, of games and, and things like that, just very simple things. And then I got into the BBS world in 1994. I was 13, uh, and it was all over from there. But then I started getting into, uh, you know, running my own BBS. I wrote some Pascal programs to automate some, like, just grungy uh, things of, you know, converting um, 
configuration files uh, from the BBS format to the format that these, these of course, again, games uh, would use uh, externally to, you know, so that people could dial in and play things like Trade Wars and uh, Legend of the Red Dragon and, and things like that, if anyone remembers. But uh, so, yeah, all about the games and the files and um, the, the wide world of uh, very odd, um, uh, you know, things being communicated and text files that are swapped around in BBSs that were uh, very much outside my... Um, insular uh, suburban Midwest kid uh, upbringing and uh, something, you know, my parents would have been very upset if they knew what I was getting up to. But, uh, um, you know, in in high school, uh, we had a programming class, uh, formal programming class with um, actual Mac, compact Mac, black and white screen computers around the room. And so I did some Pascal in that class. And then, you know, at the same time, my hobby was like, uh, you know, copying discs and CDs. So I just, you know, uh, figured out how to disassemble programs, look for the, the syscalls in, in DOS and Windows that, you know, identified whether you were running on an original disc or an original CD and just, you know, hack those out because I wanted to copy them to my hard disk and play them without having these stupid discs and CDs around. I mean, come on, like everything should be in the cloud, you know, in, in my <laughs> in front of me. So... Uh, you know, so I, I learned, you know, basically I went up and down the stack that way, just, you know, being a hacker, you know, bored kid, misfit, outcast, uh, you know, um, everything that, you know, a lot of us are familiar with. But um, then I went off to engineering school in Missouri, uh, started as an electrical engineer major and uh, ditched that after two years, uh, flunked out, uh, family problems, divorce, nasty stuff. Uh, then I was admitted back into the CS program, uh, finished my master's in CS, uh, did a lot of open source hacking. That's, uh, that's the period when I actually got into kernel hacking because I had been using Linux since 1997. I was actually one of the users of Zip Slack, which if anybody remembers Zip Slack, it was a, a Slack or Linux distribution that you could unzip onto an MS-DOS partition and, uh, you know, basically boot from, you know, just by running a batch file. And uh, so that was my dipping my toes into the Linux world. And over time, I just migrated the things I was doing to Linux because I just found Linux more expressive and uh, open for the kinds of things I wanted to do with computers, you know, very much uh, like the collaborative and, um, you know, sometimes uh, opinionated, uh, hopefully not, not too opinionated nature of open source development. And, uh, you know, so then I wanted my, my hardware to, you know, that worked so well on Windows to work on Linux. And it frustrated me when it didn't. And it frustrated me to the point where I spent, you know, late nights with uh, a cup of tea next to me and, you know, realizing the, the sun was coming up because I had been up all night uh, just, you know, digging into the, the driver for this thing and figuring out like what registers was Windows flipping that uh, was, you know, Linux driver was not, why this piece of hardware wasn't working or wasn't working optimally in some way. And so I just did that kind of stuff until I graduated. And then I, I, I graduated, did the normal software engineering stuff, you know, embedded Linux, uh, real-time simulation systems. Um, you know, actually in my, my job at the flight simulator company, I had to do a lot of reverse engineering, which was suited to my background, uh, both on the network and of, of physical devices. So that was pretty cool. And then Google came and hired me for the stuff I was doing as a hobby. Uh, not not for what my uh, my actual career trajectory was, which was uh, straight up software engineering, and so I became an SRE, and you know since then I've been doing SRE things and uh, you know helping out on that side and you know, the history of uh, my tenure at LinkedIn is is that of SRE, but um, nice. you know and we'll, we'll um, I'm I'm sure we'll talk about things that will uh, illuminate why my twisty background was able to um, you know create a contribution in this particular area so nice I, I remember back in 1997 when you were getting into Linux I was being tied to a uh, piano chair so I, I, I'm not at all jealous um, <laughs> so yeah so having been at uh, uh, LinkedIn for as an SRE for the last past of years uh, what have you been uh, wor working on what kind of work do you do today well, I joined LinkedIn. Uh, when I joined LinkedIn, I joined Ben Ferguson's team, which was at the time the, the Tools SRE team. Uh, it was a new team. It was a team that was explicitly created with the intent of providing a, um, an engineering approach to operational problems, as in the, um, you know, the core definition of, uh, of SRE, but also um, specifically evangelizing um, the idea of 
uh, operational awareness uh, in the foundation organization, which was developing all of our internal tooling at the time. And you know they they were very focused on uh, iterating and um, you know moving fast and and breaking things. And we just uh, we realized that there was a business need around not breaking things as much and uh, still being able to move fast. And so Tools SRE, um, you know, we, we explicitly helped with that. And made We're able to make uh, many, many concrete improvements uh, up and down the, the stack from the, you know, the, the source of truth for topology to the, the deployment uh, machinery to the, the private cloud, uh, fixing some, some nasty containerization bugs and operational problems with the, the services that, that comprise the private cloud. Um, so yeah, that was what I did for the first four years. And, uh, so tools SRE, um, I, I moved into LPS SRE, which is, um, the team that, uh, owns and operates LinkedIn's private cloud. And then after that, I moved to the Helix Zookeeper SRE team, uh, which was a shift, uh, very uh, interesting shift because uh, moving into that team, I knew virtually nothing about Zookeeper aside from at a purely conceptual level and where Zookeeper fits in in the, the ecosystem of distributed uh, service, uh, you know, service components uh, implementing distributed system uh, fundamentals. And um, in a matter of, uh, I was actually less than two months, I had been able to, uh, using my background in uh, you know, in four years uh, working with foundation tooling, I, I was able to create a, a framework that allowed us to measure the availability of all zookeepers at LinkedIn, uh, basically, uh, you know, with, within two months time. And so, you know, I was able to stand on the shoulders of giants and deliver something that's very important for the company. And, you know, since then, we've been using that uh, availability measurement tooling to solve one problem after another in the Zookeeper ecosystem that was Im impacting either LinkedIn's uh, customers uh, in, in terms of uh, site users or at a minimum impacting engineers at LinkedIn who are just trying to, um, you know, deliver new products and features. Yeah, a lot of things that you say, Ryan, like which are normal software engineering or normal infrastructure engineering, at least in my perspective, they, they don't sound simple at all, uh, especially your background and the, the things that you did. Uh, you mentioned games quite a bit as you were growing up. Do you still play games? I actually have not sat down and played a game in a long time. I, I, I watch I watch more videos on YouTube of other people playing games, uh, wishing that uh, I could go back in time to that life where I felt like I had enough time to be uh, to be playing games uh, so much. But yeah, there was a time in my life where uh, you know games and files were were the goal, you know? <laughs> and every every means was a means to that end. Uh, so and but it was that's how I learned. Uh, that's yeah. how I learned uh, the things that I, that I do today. But, you know, I have fond memories of games like like Privateer uh, was was one that was uh, very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I also I spent a lot of time on MUDs, if anybody remembers those. Uh, these are sort of the, the predecessor to today's MMOs. And um, if anyone remembers EverQuest, that was more or less the first uh, graphical uh, MUD that was um, that was massively multiplayer. Before that, there was Ultima Online which was uh, smaller in scale and uh, more themed around the ultimate universe. But MUDs were just a, um, a text-based, uh, you know, basically multiverse that um, people could join over the internet in the early days of the internet and interact with other people in real time in um, a text, a textual shared space, um, you know, sort of akin to the, the same kind of metaphor that IRC used or that Slack uses today, kind of this shared space where people interact via via text and um, emoting and things like that. But uh, for me, I mean, MUDs was where that really started. And so we, I, I was into those. And, and that's a whole nother story, all the all the shenanigans <laughs> and network hopping that we did to get around, uh, you know, net blocks and all those kind of things. But fun times. Nice. Well, you, you definitely have a fascinating background. And Knowing you personally, like this is something our listeners wouldn't know, but when I joined LinkedIn, I was on the same team as Ryan. And I before I met you, Ryan, I, I heard about you from all the other team members. And one thing that I heard consistently from everyone was, if I had a problem or a tricky situation that I was dealing with, either with Linux or distributed systems, and I couldn't find the answer via Google or Stack Overflow, 
I should just go and ask Ryan. <laughs> and that that has been consistently true. And we'll we'll dive deep into the example and on one of those examples today. But before we jump there, uh, everyone who works with you knows about this skill set, which is rarely known to people who probably don't work with you. Is how did you get so good with memes? <laughs> That was um, that was a required skill at at Google. Um, basically, uh, you know, becoming a, a a meme master, or at least uh, you know, moving along the uh, the uh, walking the path uh, towards meme masterhood is just uh, if if anybody has worked at Google, uh, they would understand. And if they haven't worked at Google, you'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> well, we'll we'll take your word for it then, uh, and. Like like we mentioned, you, your knowledge spreads in multiple dimensions, both in breadth and depth. And one of the things that we wanted to touch on today is the blog post that you recently published uh, that talks about a very interesting and tricky situation uh, that you encountered in Linux system performance. Uh, before we dive into exactly what the issue was, in your blog post, you mentioned uh, reimaging machines and OS subgrid initiative at LinkedIn. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Well, I think you could tell us a little more about that. <laughs> but uh, the the short version of the story is that uh, basically the the decision was made to uh, get off of um, Red Hat Seven, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Seven, for for various business reasons, um, uh, cost savings reasons, uh, synergy with with Microsoft, and those sorts of things. Nothing against Red Hat specifically. It's just that we had um, you know as an organization evolved past essentially what their, uh, what their support model was uh, able to provide for us with the kinds of things we were doing. So, um, so the decision was made to move to uh, a CentOS uh, platform image by using Microsoft's uh, kernel from Azure, uh, and which was uh, perfectly reasonable because Microsoft uh, hires a lot of people to work specifically on the kernel. And uh, so why should LinkedIn duplicate that effort if, if we don't need to? Um, or be be beholden to an external vendor who has you know their own roadmap, their own priorities that aren't necessarily aligned with ours, and we don't have a lot of influence over theirs. Um, so, uh, you know, so that that decision was made by SRE Exec, and um, the part that my understanding is LPS SRE specifically undertook was to reimage the um, the general. Uh, rain pools, which is basically, this is akin to um, what most people would think of uh, when they, they just um, request a, um, you know, an instance on AWS. It's just, they, they have no idea other than the region it's in, which specific hardware they're going to be getting or what, what the characteristics of that hardware is other than it meets a specific performance class that, that Amazon advertises. And so, um, as opposed to the the other pools at LinkedIn, which are uh, application specific, this is the the general pool, which is sort of the default pool that anybody who wants to deploy a, a random application lands on, right? Yeah, it makes sense. So this is like the multi-tenant cloud where you get to ask for a compute resource and you get it through an API call where you're not worrying about exactly which host that you get. Uh, so the OS upgrade initiative involved upgrading these set of machines, which are on the multi-tenant cloud. Uh, one thing that you also refer to in the blog post is uh, various noisy neighbor problems in multi-tenant environments in general. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of these noisy neighbor problems that people usually hit in these kind of situations. Oh, yeah. Um, so, well, one, one noisy neighbor problem that we had initially in, in Rain was, uh, was simply that of uh, swap utilization. Uh, competing for disk IO, so uh, disk disk IOP availability is uh, you know like you can you can always push uh, IO requests through to a disk. The only question is what's the latency of those IO requests being serviced. And so if you start filling up the the queue on the disk, uh, you're you're just waiting for stuff to be streamed out to disk. So if you have, for example, multiple applications that are um, logging at a very high rate or multiple applications which are making memory allocations which are being satisfied either partially or fully through uh, through swap allocations or through um, you know pushing pushing in active pages out to swap uh, in order to um, to avoid a, a low memory uh, situation uh, those will create noisy neighbor situations uh, because um, a 
a neighbor who is not uh, creating the resource burden is uh, unfairly um, uh, impacted in terms of their own latency because uh, some other process on the host is is creating a resource burden. And other examples of this could be um, contention for uh, for NIC uh, bandwidth on on for example you know one gig NIC hosts. So you know it's sometimes you have to move to a ten gig NIC host to to get more bandwidth. Other things would be like um, you know memory bandwidth itself uh, is it's a global resource that can be uh, used unfairly by by one actor. Uh, we saw that with, um, you know, actually we, we didn't see this on rain necessarily, but, uh, we saw this on espresso nodes where, uh, one a process would be doing a uh, Java garbage collection and actually starve the, um, you know, the rest of the, uh, system of, uh, memory bandwidth because there were ECC errors that were reducing the amount of uh, memory bandwidth available to the, the cores on that system. And so, um, the, the global resource was exhausted. Another classic one is, uh, cache. Uh, thrashing. So when when processes are not uh, not pinned to cores, when they're 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 free to schedule on any core, um, the the working set for uh, for one process will uh, you know it has it has different uh, cache semantics uh, than the working set for another process. I, I mean, different not just different cache semantics, but the working set itself is different. So the the data and um, and code caches in the CPU are going to be nuked every time that. Um, that process is swapped out and, you know, and having to be basically reloaded by going to main memory. And so that, that creates a slow start issue for whenever that, that task is scheduled. So, uh, so, you know, these, a lot of these can be kind of bucketed into, um, in, in a general term, what we call thrashing issues where thrashing, uh, sort of indicates that somebody, uh, somebody who wants to use resources is experiencing high latency because somebody else has, uh, caused that resource to be used in such a way that is causing, um, you know, the the one who wants to use it to to be queued to to have to wait on some some physical characteristic, uh, some physical limitation of some kind. So, okay, and these are interesting noisy neighbor problems. And as you mentioned in the blog post, that as you were moving the fleet to CentOS uh, in this multi-tenant environment, there was a problem that you identified, but it wasn't a noisy neighbor issue. Can you tell us more about that? Right. Uh, and the problem when it was brought to me was brought to me as a, an, an IO weight issue that it, it was simply that on machines running the, the newer kernel uh, as compared to the, uh, the Red Hat um, Enterprise Linux 7 kernel, uh, which was a 3.x kernel. Uh, we had this newer 4.x kernel and we were seeing that when multiple processes were doing um, sequential uh, I.O. At, simultaneously, uh, such as uh, like artifacts being downloaded for deployment or uh, logging um, and, uh, you know, with with multiple uh, concurrent streams, that I.O. weight was going up on the host uh, very much in not in proportion to the I.O. weight that would have been generated on the same host with the um, the three point X kernel from Red Hat. So um, the noisy neighbor issue in that sense was that, uh, it, you know, symptomatic rather than, uh, fundamental. So it was, it was a symptomatic noisy neighbor issue in the sense that one process was able to create IO weight that was causing another process to, to be stuck in the run queue, um, simply because it was, it was doing IO to the disc and not because the disc itself had a fundamental, a hardware limitation of any kind that was causing uh, that that was justifying uh, you know causing a process to to wait. It seemed like there was something in the software that was doing this, and uh, you know as as it turned out, you know we were right about that, and we'll we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Yeah. So in this case, the effect was uh, an application would experience higher 99th percentile latencies if another application was deployed on the same physical server. And it wasn't because of any limitations on the hardware side, like you mentioned, but it was something in the software software that was limiting the performance. That, that's right. And the first, uh, my first suspicion was that it was it was going to be uh, you know something related to uh, mutual exclusion or or locking. And I looked at the usual things I would look at for uh, debugging that sort of problem, which would be um, perf top, 
to look for, um, you know, spin lock uh, utilization, um, which given that there was virtually no uh, system CPU, uh, you know, core, no, no core on kernel time uh, disproportionate to um, uh, what, what we would have seen on the 3.x kernel. Uh, it didn't seem like there was any kind of, um, you know, a spin lock meltdown or anything like that going on. So then the other question was what, um, you know, is it possible that we're waiting, just, just waiting around for some lock that that's being inefficient or something like that. And so to look into that, I used the magic sysrq, uh, I think it's uh, sysrql, um, we, we don't actually have console access to our servers, but, uh, you know, I triggered it using procfs. And what that does is it dumps the stack of all the cores on the host to um, the kernel message buffer so that you can see uh, for a snapshot at any point in time. And by the way, this only works on SMP hosts because on a single processor host, the stack is always going to be, uh, you know, on, for the single core in that host, it's going to be the stack of the, um, you know, the kernel uh, function that actually prints that thing out to the kernel message buffer. So it's not that helpful. But when you have 24 cores, you have 23 cores that are presumably doing other things. And so often you can see um, that these cores are just stacking up, kind of waiting in the same mutual exclusion primitive and uh, can kind of figure out what went wrong that way. And so in this case, I did not see anything like that. It was just slow. It was uh, very strange. And the way this problem got surfaced is uh, these applications started seeing higher latencies when they were deployed on the newer kernel. And that's, right. that's also how you started looking into the problem and dissecting it and seeing it performs perfectly fine on the older version, but not necessarily on the newer one. And did that lead you down the path of thinking it has something to do with the kernel and the investigation you did with uh, SysRQ and other tools? Uh, well, the the thing that led me to believe it had something to to do with the kernel was simply the combination of that the kernel was the um, the the main thing. You know, I, I mean, like user space changed in CentOS uh, as well, but user space changes don't uh, generally produce this massive increase in I/O weight because I I/O weight is the kernel. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's telling a process it cannot be scheduled at the moment because it's it's waiting on a resource a, you know a, a shared underlying resource whether it's a block device or some some other device that is consuming io uh, of some kind and the kernel's telling that process to sleep because uh, it can't it can't do its work in the meantime so uh, it needs to sleep so that's some other some other process which can do work other than um, io to a device that's that's currently busy um, you know can be done so uh, so those things together are just, I, I mean, my, my intuition, uh, you know, basically bisected this, you know, away from a, a user space problem and into a, into a kernel problem that way. That's fascinating. Uh, one, one tool that you also mention in an arsenal in the blog is ATOP. Uh, tell us more about what ATOP does. Yeah. A, ATOP is a great tool of something that I learned to use effectively at Google because we used it to debug problems on, on Borg hosts, uh, especially no noisy neighbor type of problems. And so ATOP is a tool that allows you to, at a glance, uh, see a essentially everything that is important about your system from a resource utilization perspective. Um, many people stop at top because they're, you know, they see, okay, my, my cores are doing this, you know, I have so much, so much memory that's, you know, RSS, so much memory that's uh, virtual allocation. I can see which process is at the top, you know, that that's busy and, and, uh, and so on. But ATOP gives you much more of a, uh, you know, of a picture of what's going on because not only can it use the process accounting mechanism that's built into the kernel to um, accurately uh, attribute uh, disk utilization to specific processes which used it, even ephemeral processes which had disappeared in between sampling intervals, which is incredibly important when you have, uh, for example, forking model um, type type processes you're trying to debug, like like we do in our Python ecosystem. Um, but al also, it gives you it gives you everything uh, at one glance. Virtual memory, uh, you know, it tells you. Uh, when I'm having to, you know, when I'm undergoing f uh, free page scans because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having such memory pressure on the system. Uh, swap activity is all there. Um, uh, page fault activity. Um, 
basically, uh, you know, and it has several different views depending on what you want to, to look at. Do I want to look at what looks like a primarily disk I.O. problem? I can hit D and have a view that, that gives me, you know, those, um, you know, in, things that would be interesting in that context. I can hit P, you know, give me things that are interesting in the context of, well, I seem to, I seem to be having a compute problem uh, in the sense of that this, um, you know, this system is not uh, stacking up performance wise, what's, what's going on. And then, you know, it's just the, the general view, the, the G view is a, is a great overview of, of both of those things, you know? So um, it's just a, it's just a great a scope in, into a system. I mean, it's my, my go-to tool. I don't bother with anything else. Um, it really, it's the first thing I go to. Um, so, and it has a nice uh, demonized mode also that allows it to record all of this stuff uh, historically so that you can, you can go back in time and see, you know, even like all the, the process accounting uh, aspect for, you know, accounting to disk IO. Like if I saw that a host was just slammed with IO at some point in time and I was running a top of daemon mode, I could very easily just go back in time and see, oh, what was happening on that host at that time? And, oh, it looks like this, um, you know, this automation process, you know, kicked off a bunch of children that all were trying to, you know, uh, read a gigantic um, file and, you know, write it out at the same time, you know, and then I know exactly what, what happened. Oh, that sounds like a very useful tool. And I know I hadn't heard of ATOP uh, until I met you and I heard about ATOP from you. We'll definitely add a link to this tool in our show notes when you publish the episode. Uh, and in general, this tool sounds like a very useful tool. Uh, thing in for containerized environments specifically uh, where you have a bunch of processes using shared resources uh, now that you knew that there was this io performance issue as you're upgrading these machines you had kind of symptoms from the applications running on these uh, newer kernel and through your intuition you identified that this problem has to do more on the kernel side uh, how did you proceed next yeah, the, the next thing I looked at was uh, because 4.x 4, 4 has BlockMQ and BlockMQ has uh, some different uh, I.O. schedulers. Uh, I tried playing around with the I.O. schedulers um, to see if one I.O. scheduler or the other made a difference. I also, for uh, at least for a minute, uh, not too much longer, thought that maybe um, uh, disk I.O. quotas had possibly been introduced on the on the CFQ side, and so you know I, I investigated that because that that could account for um, IO IO blockage uh, happening, but uh, none of that turned anything up. And actually, it was kind of by a stroke of luck while I was looking into those things, one of the engineers in Pi uh, noticed that there was a, an issue on Red Hat's Bugzilla about a uh, actually yes, it was on Red Hat's internal support. Um, uh, you know, ticket system uh, that somebody else was complaining about that they had an IO regression in RHEL 8, which has a, a you know, a 4.x kernel, and that um, they thought it was related to, um, you know, there's there's a public uh, Bugzilla uh, kernel upstream bug related to this where people had uh, SATA SSDs and were having a, um, you know, uh, it, it, well, SSDs or HDDs in this case, and they were having a um, basically a massive um, penalty in the same type of situation that uh, that we had, which was um, uh, sequential I.O. and, you know, using block MQ. So um, that kind of led me in the direction that something was going on with, with block MQ. And taking uh, Jens Oxbow had a very simple patch uh, related to the scalable bitmap uh, code in block MQ. Uh, that is a scalable bitmap. There, there's you can read a lot more about this online. But basically, scalable bitmap is a mechanism that allows an um, allows IOs to be submitted efficiently across multiple cores without a uh, without having a, a logjam on any one particular core. And uh, there, many of the advanced IO schedulers, you know, built around block MQ or you know are leveraging this the scalable bitmap primitive. But you know, it was a very simple patch to reduce the number of queues in uh, a scalable bitmap, and it actually it produced an improvement. Like it didn't it didn't fix the problem, but it produced an improvement, and so that was what kind of gave me you know a uh, more you know intuitively um, a suspicion that this was the right direction to go, um, seeing improvement with that. So 
uh, based on that, I just, um, I thought, well, you know, we have this platform image uh, that is different, but I think the kernel is the problem. So what would happen if I installed a 3X kernel on one of these CentOS hosts and, and redid the benchmark? And it was the realization from there that using the same kernel config, but using a 3X upstream kernel, uh, the problem did not appear. Uh, that uh, then it was like, okay, well, uh, this is interesting because I have a good kernel, which is a 3x uh, using the same config from the 4x kernel uh, and using block and queue, and we don't have this problem, and I have a 4x kernel, which is bad. And from there, I just went straight into, okay, you know, I mean, you just roll up your sleeves and bisect at that point because you know the problem is somewhere between, you know, T and, you know, T plus one. So bisecting is something that I want to definitely get to. Before we do that, can you briefly describe for our listeners uh, what is Block MQ? So, uh, Block MQ is the uh, it's it's the um, the Block I/O layer for the Linux kernel. This is the layer that every every block device, uh, every hard disk, every uh, you know uh, flash memory device, anything that is seekable. Uh, and it's seekable, uh, durable storage uh, registers with the block layer in order for um, I/O requests to be forwarded from uh, either from from file system drivers or just from you know for, when when raw block device I/O is being done, like with with DD or things like that. Um, those I/O requests go through the block layer. They are um, combined and aggregated in a very uh, simple way, uh, the name of which escapes me at the moment, and then uh, the block layer forwards the um, the aggregated request to the I/O scheduler, which then um, you know based on whatever the semantics of the I/O scheduler are, which are often semantics that are attuned towards a specific uh, underlying type of block device, taking into account the, the physical characteristics of that block device, such as the elevator uh, I/O schedule. IO scheduler algorithm is one that is um, specifically designed for uh, disk devices that have a seek penalty, uh, for example. So, um, but block MQ is the replacement for the legacy block IO layer, and block MQ is called block MQ because it's um, it's MQ stands for multi queue, and the idea is that you can have instead of having one queue that is uh, not scalable because uh, there's there's one lock around this queue where you know if an IO is is taken off the queue or an IO is being put back on the queue that what whichever core is doing that operation has to have the lock for that queue and of course if you have uh, 20 cores on a like we we got into a world where um, we we were we were uh, you know back back in the 80s and 90s it was uh, PCs versus uh, vertical scalability and then uh, giant mainframes and and things like that and then we got back into the you know with Google and and massively distributed systems we got into the world where we were doing more horizontal scalability and vertical scalability kind of fell by the wayside as all the you know the big iron unix vendors went out of business one by one in this new world and then uh, around 2000 uh, between 2006 and 2010 uh, with the, the core architecture and uh, AMD's um, also uh, the bulldozer and um, the uh, you know sub subsequent uh, architectures, uh, we we hit a, we realized that we were hitting a limit with core uh, scalability in terms of the ability to scale clock speeds uh, infinitely upwards and the ability to scale instructions uh, per per cycle uh, IPC uh, upwards. And so we needed to increase the parallelism of, of cores, you know, in, in a, a host. And so we've moved back into this world of vertical scalability as a result. And because we've, uh, we've moved back into this world of vertical scalability, we have, of course, um, parallelism uh, becoming front and center uh, again to, to what we're doing, a specific host. And so that's why uh, the Linux, the, the legacy block IO layer became a bottleneck because with this increasing parallelism, you know, where at first it was uh, two cores, four cores, six cores, and then it became eight, 12, 16, 24 cores, uh, 24 cores per CPU package. I mean, and, and especially with uh, with hyper threading uh, enabled, which which increases parallelism, uh, you know, with, without necessarily increasing the, the functional 
uh, the functional unit uh, capacity of a CPU, but increases parallelism, which again increases the ability to submit IOs uh, at a very rapid rate. And if I'm doing that, then my IOQ itself becomes the bottleneck if my IOQ uh, is uh, one entity which has to be managed by, you know, in, in sequential fashion by a single, um, a single core. And so BlockMQ solved that problem by, uh, you know, creating basically per core IO queues uh, such that uh, an I.O. that needs to be submitted to a block device can be added to any I.O. queue on any core, which is, you know, any core which is idle or uh, isn't currently holding a lock for its I.O. queues. So it massively increases the, the uh, potential parallelism of I.O. submission. And this became very important also, uh, not just for, uh, you know, like... It, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem if you had 24 cores all submitting I.O. to, you know, a hard disk because that, the hard disk is a single command queue. I mean, it can do some reordering, but ultimately it's kind of a FIFO uh, piece of hardware. You just you stuff commands into it. It executes those commands, you know, returns the, the results and then um, the queue drains and you can stuff more stuff into the queue. But multi-queue hardware uh, is it's the main impetus for... Um, for uh, block MQ, which is the, so that I can have, uh, for example, an NVMe device that can have, uh, I think, up to uh, you know 64, 128 uh, independent hardware queues. Uh, you know, some of this might be virtualized in the hardware. I mean, who, who knows what's really going on? But at least in terms of the logical queues that it, it presents to the host, many, many more queues are available. And so if I have only one I.O. queue for the host to submit I.O.s to, you know, I have not not just that uh, contention problem in the IOQ, but also I'm I'm being inefficient in terms of maximizing the the hardware utilization. So to increase utilization on devices with parallel um, parallel hardware queues, uh, you know, BlockMQ is the solution for that too. Because um, I have if I have a queue per core, and I have all cores submitting I/O at the same time, I'm I'm doing the best I can in terms of getting I/O out to the hardware because I I couldn't do any better without more cores. I oh. hope that makes sense. Yeah, th thanks for explaining that. Uh, now, coming back to the bisecting, so you mentioned there are, you see different outcomes in T and T plus one version of the kernel. I was just looking at the Linux kernel repo on GitHub. It has a million commits. So between T and T plus one, I can just imagine there being thousands of commits. So how do you go about bisecting something like that? Yeah, the, well, I mean, the great thing is you can actually have uh, multiple problems uh, in those millions of commits too. That that makes your day even more fun. Uh, but yeah, uh, so long story short, I mean, Git one one of the great tools that Git has built in is the the bisect tool, and the bisect tool is a it, it's just it's a workflow that uh, once you've entered this workflow allows you to. Um, and so uh, your your head pointer will be pointing to as a, a specific commit on the the bisect branch that's created for this workflow, and um, you you tell Git at each for for each commit. Um, so so I, I start bisecting. I tell Git what my my bad revision is, and I tell it what my good revision is. And it expects it expects that my good revision is is older, and my my bad revision is newer. And uh, but you can also you can also invert those things. I mean, there's it's it it, it doesn't matter. It just all all Git wants to know is uh, what's the starting commit where where we're starting the bisect and what's the ending commit where we're we're ending the bisect. And it just picks the midpoint between those those commits and uh, gives you you know sets sets head to point to that uh, commit and then expects you to do testing at that commit and then give it feedback whether that. Uh, at that commit, it is good or bad, and then um, so you 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 have your two ends. You're at the midpoint. You've bisected, and you said, okay, well, um, this one is bad too. So Git knows that. Oh, okay. Well, we need to go further back in time to figure out where this was good, and so it bisects between. You know, it takes the midpoint between those two commits until you get down to um, eventually. You know, it, I mean, it's a logarithmic function of. Uh, the, you know, for, for the number of steps that you need to, to bisect. So, you know, if you had a million commits, it's going to be, you know, log base two of a million, um, you know, to, you know, the number of steps that you're going to have to do, unless you're really lucky. Uh, but, um, yeah, so once you've gotten down to the actual commit that's bad, then you can figure out, like, Git doesn't prescribe what you do with that. It just tells you which commit uh, flipped the the state of the system from from good to bad and then expects you to fix it from there so do, do you know how many steps you had to go through um in, in this um, bisecting 
I think I calculated it at one point. It was something like 17 steps. Okay, no, not, not too bad. But when you're bisecting and yeah. identifying uh, these commits, are you also testing the kernel at those commits and with different patches to see if it solves a problem? Uh, yeah, well, yes. So, so the, the bad kernel that I had was the, um, you know, the 4.19 kernel and the good kernel that I had was, I, I realized that like four point, you know, 4.3 or something was good. So I, I knew that, you know, the problem was somewhere between those. And, um, uh, so in between like each time, you know, I would, I would bisect, I would tell Git, uh, you know, what, what was the result? And then I would take that. I would, you know, copy in, you know, I nuke the, you know, you know, do a make Mr. Proper, uh, um, you know, copy in the, the config, you know, so I'm starting from a clean slate and then, you know, do a parallel build of the kernel, which, you know, it took three to four minutes on a, I mean, these are fast 24 core machines. So, I mean, it's, it's not, not that slow. Um, and then, uh, built a, um, uh, you know, just use the kernel's, uh, own, um, scaffolding for building an R a kernel RPM, uh, installed the RPM on the host and then, uh, you know, told grub to, you know, grub two dash reboot, uh, you know, we'll, we'll tell it to boot a specific kernel next and, and then just, you know, rebooted the host. And of course the, these hosts are in data centers, uh, they're headless hosts. I mean, so every time I reboot, it's kind of a leap of faith that we're going to get through the firmware, um, that the kernel's not going to be bad. And there, there were a few bad intermediate kernels that were, you know, failed in interesting ways. And so, you know, we had to work with the, uh, you know, the sysops team and uh, data center team to recover the host uh, sometimes. And, you know, sometimes my, you know, my day would just be over on a specific host and I'd have to go find another host to, you know, to continue on. And so I'd have to copy all my stuff to that new host and, you know, get, get started with the workflow again. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just uh, a lot of steps of that. I mean, uh, it, if there were 17 steps, I mean, two to the 17th is, uh, what, you know, 100, 128 case or something like a, you know, I mean, you said a million, but I mean, it's not that far off. I mean, probably hundred, hundred K plus commits in between where, uh, you know, where we were. So, um, you, you say that extremely lightly, that's a lot of commits to bisect, to be honest, from my perspective, like that sounds right. extremely daunting to even get started with. But in, you know, in computer science, we have a, a general approach to problems of divide and conquer yep. that exploits uh, logarithmic, um, you know, um, reduction in um, the time that's taken to do something when you, you take a divide and conquer strategy. And so bisecting is just another another form of doing that. Um, it, and frankly, it could have been automated. Uh, it's just that when I did the calculation, I realized that it was only going to take 17 steps to, you know, at worst to figure this out. I just made a, I made a spot call that, you know, I would just burn some time on it rather than, you know, building automation around this that isn't really, you know, I, I didn't see another direct use case for. So, yeah. And I would also say that the divide and conquer approach that you mentioned is also super helpful, not just when you're bisecting commits, but also when you're just trying to evaluate various possibilities, uh, trying to debug something. Right. Uh, well, and divide and conquer in algorithmic terms is, is of course, it's a separate concept from uh, fault isolation in systems engineering terms, but they, they, they do have overlap conceptually in that you, you, want to, uh, you want to narrow down the amount of work that's done by um, you know, constraining the, you know, the working set in some way. And so, you know, the, the dividing, you know, fault isolation is sort of divide and conquer uh, approach being, advided, mm -hmm. you know, being applied to systems engineering. So you're, you're right about that. That's a good observation. And as you're checking these different commits in different kernel versions, you mentioned that you use something like a FIO test uh, to check if a specific kernel of, uh, version of the kernel is good. Uh, can you tell yeah. us more about that? Yeah, FIO is a tool that is, um, I, I believe it was developed or at least it's maintained by Jens also. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's distributed on kernel.org. So it's a very, you know, it's a core uh, regression testing tool for uh, file system and you know block device driver maintainers, but uh, FIO basically just gives you a, a suite of tests that you can sort of um, uh, slice and dice, uh, mix and match, and you can you can determine the parallelism, you can determine the test um, semantics, uh, whether you're doing sequential I/O, random I/O, direct I/O, buffered I/O, all, all those sorts of sorts of things and uh, how long the test is going to take. And it's just, it's a very nice tool. And uh, this, the Sysens team had, you know, while I was working on um, these other things, uh, and this, this is what made bisect in the kernel very straightforward in the end was having this FIO tool to get very clear AB signal 
on whether you know a particular kernel was was good or not and um they had you know wor working on their own developed a fio test that gave clear signal between a host that was um you know that that was fine um for at least for the application team's purposes and a host that was uh problematic and so um using that that test i was you know it was very helpful to um very quickly figure out whether a particular kernel build was was good or bad. I mean, the the signal was crystal clear, uh, night and day. So, and this fire test also significantly reduced the time to test out these different kernels because deploying an application and just testing for its ninety nine percent high latency again sounds very expensive in general. Right. Uh, exactly. And we we avoided that whole uh, that whole closed loop and. Additionally, because of the the JVM that we're using, requires a a kernel module to be uh, to be built and uh, available at at runtime. Uh, getting that kernel module built was you know not necessarily a straightforward task. Uh, that that was something I would have had to be done on every kernel, um, you know every every intermediate kernel, uh, you know bisected and um, being able to use the FIO test as a proxy for the application. Um, uh, I/O uh, experience mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, very much shortened the the cycle time. So, you know, yeah, uh, it, was, it was crucial. And one after you are doing these tests and getting these A/B signals, uh, how did you end up identifying the root cause and what was the root cause? Uh, well, the root cause was uh, two two different patches. Uh, I don't recall exactly what they were. One was. One was related to um, security of, uh, like if a um, uh, if a file was erased, uh, that in ensuring that no no data from that file uh, was it could be leaked out to somebody who subsequently like uh, did an MMAP allocation of the you know the, you know and got the same disk block and was able to see the you know the the data that was left over from the previous file um, on it, and the other was related to um well, anyway i i can't remember exactly but both of them were ext4 patches and neither of them were at all obviously related to the issue at hand uh, they were both com you know looked looked completely orthogonal but when it came down to it i checked and double checked and in in both cases applying either of these patches um you know caused the um the io latency to to reappear and um, with both of them removed and even in the 419 kernel, which was interesting because a lot of the internal kernel APIs had had changed by that point. Um, so I had to actually hand back port or hand, hand forward port the revert of one of those because it, it did not revert uh, cleanly on 419. So um, fortunately that worked and, um, you know, and I'm sure everybody's comforted to know that, um, you know, my hand rolled code uh, is, uh, you know, a component of our ext4 driver on you know tens of thousands of hosts in our data centers running our production stack so yeah that that sounds fascinating um and the fact that you were able to identify the problem and actually fix it uh it's just amazing uh you, you identify a lot of lessons learned in this process if you had to pick the top two which ones would those be uh, well, the top one is one that I think we've internalized as an organization, which is that we need to have a formalized uh, regression testing around platform images and kernels. And fortunately, that is something that is um, is so obvious that it was immediately funded, and that's that's an ongoing project to uh, you know internally to put that automated regression testing in place, so we we never run into something like this again. Um, the other uh, thing that was probably an interesting learning is just how well we can work together as an organization when we have a shared, um, very clear objective to rally around and where, um, you know, the individual, uh, you know, IC engineers uh, are able to um, have their plates cleared and, uh, and focus down on this problem um, instead of uh, kind of having a, I mean, a, an organization that would have been less effective would have kind of you know acknowledged that this was a problem and you know allowed people to freelance on it in their spare time but not actually uh, committed uh, resources to 
to tackling it such that the ICs that ultimately contributed the, the key building blocks of the solution had the laser focus time that they needed to, you know, to really, um, to get there. And, you know, it's not that you have to focus on it 100% all the time from beginning to end. Sometimes you just have some downtime, such as, I mean, downtime for me was bisecting the kernel. It's just like, it's repetitive tasks that you just have to um, just grin and bear it because you know that there's a pot of gold at, at the end of it, you know, one, once you get to the end. Um, but then, you know, once you get to that point, once you have that, that, that additional nugget of information that gives you the, you know, what you need to move forward to the next step, then again, you have to have, you know, like managers have to agree that resources are going to be dedicated to this problem such that you're not being pulled off of this for on-call, for, you know, for, for project, other project work, for, you know, for other interrupts, for, for tickets, for, you know, for, for ad hoc asks. I mean, what, whatever these things are, you know, that, you know, managers need to protect their, their ICs so they can really get, um, you know, impactful tactical work like this done. So um, I wasn't sh sure beforehand uh, how, you know, I mean, I, if you had asked me how well we would have functioned uh, getting this done, I wouldn't have been sure what to tell you, but I was impressed that we, you know, especially given the, you know, the unusual situation that we were in this year, that uh, people were really able to, um, you know, clear their plates and, and roll up their sleeves. So Nice, nice, nice. Um, so taking a step back now, it, it sounds like you became an expert at Linux uh, kernel almost unintentionally by sort of hacking to scratch your own itch. Um, do you have any advice for our listeners who want to maybe more intentionally get better, get a better understanding of uh, how Linux, uh, Linux kernel works? Uh, yeah, so, um, and the first thing I would do is take uh, issue with the, um, you know, the phrase expert, because uh, there are very few experts at, at the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is huge. It's one of the biggest software projects that has ever existed with the, the most contributors uh, to, to a single code base that, you know, in, in history. Um, so, I mean, nobody's an expert. You just, you have to, uh, you have to adopt a learner's mindset and always have that, that learner's hat on because there's always something, there's always something that you're, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, dissecting, uh, you know, a frog in biology class or something like that. Like, you kind of know what the, um, you know, what the outside of the frog looks like. You, you kind of know what the inside's gonna look like, but you don't know what it's really gonna look like until you've actually cut it open and, and looked inside. And then for each one of the components that are inside it, well, you, you kind of know what they look like because you're, you're looking at them, but you don't really know how, you know, what it looks like on the inside or what it does until you, you've cut open that, you know, that, that heart or that, that lung or that, you know, that liver or whatever it is. And so, you know, the, the Linux kernel is kind of, you know, a lot like that. I mean, you can, you can describe it, and broad swaths, you can kind of know what, you know, general terms, what uh, different uh, components of it do, like uh, the VM subsystem, the, um, the block IO subsystem, you know, what, what uh, different drivers do, the driver frameworks, you know, what the, uh, you know, the kernel itself, the, the scheduler, the, um, you know, the platform specific code, you, you can know what those things do in general terms, but, you know, you don't really know until you've actually dug into it and, you know, had a good problem in front of you to incentivize uh, digging into it you know like I did not I didn't know how page reclaim uh, worked in the kernel until I had an actual problem in front of me on LinkedIn's private cloud uh, having to um, you know to debug and, and ultimately mitigate this this containerization problem that we were having and so you know but by by having this problem in front of me and being willing to just crack open the, the source code and read it without being intimidated by it um, you know so I would say to answer that question, it's it's an interesting problem, uh, combined with um, just having a learner's mindset and innate curiosity, and uh, and not not being afraid of um, you know peering inside the black box of something. Uh, you know, it's it's not going to it's not going to hurt anything. For this is just knowledge. It's like you know like you know cracking open a book off the library shelf. I mean, it's a very different kind of knowledge. It's knowledge that. Uh, changes on an ongoing basis because you know the Linux kernel is a it's it's a moving um, it's a living organism it's a moving system you know it's constantly changing undergoing very very large change 
uh, you know, on a regular basis. But you know, some things are conserved relatively well. You know, some structures are conserved, uh, conserved even while other structures are evolving fast. So uh, you know, just uh, open mind, uh, curiosity, and you know, uh, check your ego at the door because you're you're not going to understand the whole thing, and you don't have to to do something impactful. I was uh, very motivated, you know, by your by your talk, but then you you kind of gung with the with the dissecting the frog, which reminded you know me so of uh, some painful memories. But um, c c coming back, um, you've already mentioned how useful ATOP is. Uh, but that aside, what was the last tool that you discovered and really liked? The last tool that I discovered. Very good question. Uh, or is the hashtag a top for life? I, I, I don't have a specific. I, 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 well, I don't have a specific tool in mind that I've just I've just recently discovered. I, uh, the I, I mean, so I mean, J X ray is one that I've been using for uh, analyzing Java heap dumps. And that one is developed by an engineer here at LinkedIn. So, I mean, that's that's a cool tool. Um, it tells you exactly what's going on with your Java heap, and uh, you know if you're in garbage collection, what's uh, what's triggering it. So, a little bit off topic from where we were, but that's a recent tool that I've run into. Awesome. Well, um, that, that's uh, that's it for us. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, they can find me on GitHub or on LinkedIn. I do have a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> nice. Um, and anything else you'd like to share with uh, with our listeners? I would just say that the more people that are curious enough about the kernel to be willing to, um, you know, to learn some uh, operating system fundamentals, uh, maybe some some C uh, to uh, dig into um, how systems work uh, using tools like uh, like ATOP or um, you know IOTOP or uh, you know even. Yeah, VM stat and and things like that. You know, more more classic tools. Um, you know, the more people that are willing to dig into these things, the better off we are as an industry uh, because we break down the the kind of wall of isolation between uh, pure SWE uh, mindset, which is kind of a, a world of abstractions and algorithms, and the pure uh, systems mindset, which is one of um, you know bare metal machinery and you know making things you know. Uh, uh, run smoothly in the operational sense and, you know, making, bringing those two perspectives together into more of a holistic uh, mindset. And I think we're all better engineers when we, when we merge those two things and we, we do better things for the industry when we do. So. Absolutely. Um, it is always a pleasure to talk to you, Ryan. And whenever we do, I learn a lot and today was no different. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a pleasure. Thanks, Ronner. Thanks, Kwong, Austin. Appreciate your time. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and learn more about us at softwaremisadventures.com. You can also write to us at hello at softwaremisadventures.com. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, take care.